Well, everybody, uh, you know, this time of year begins a transition into fall. And with that, we start thinking a little bit more about dried flowers. And that's why I asked my guest this week to join me. Welcome, Bex, to the Flower Podcast. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I um, I know it's late there, and I so appreciate your time. And, you know... Seeing what you do and how you kind of do everything, all the magic you create, um, I always have to ask that question to every one of my guests. How did you get started working with flowers and where did this passion come from? Well, it's been, I would say working with plants maybe um, has always been a constant in my life. So I have always gardened from a really, really young age I'm in my 40s now and even when I was kind of in my teens I would be helping my mom in her garden and spending pocket money in the garden center and so I've always had that kind of thread throughout my life um and when we moved into our first house when we I was in my 20s I was growing sweet peas from seed and you know we had an allotment so that has always been there so I wouldn't have said that kind of the move into flowers was a massive surprise for anyone that knows me just because they know how much I love nature really um but how I came to sort of come in contact with dry flowers and fall in love with them was just quite serendipitous um I I think it's probably important to say that my I have lots of memories of dried flowers from my childhood because my grandma used to kind of decorate her home with them and my mum was one for always bringing forage bits in, especially at Christmas time. She was always make her own decorations and I used to help her with that. So, um, yeah, what happened and obviously I'll kind of talk you through the, the process that I got to being with flowers. But that I guess it's important to kind of know that it was always there, if you like. Um, sure. But anyway, I had been given a bunch of flowers from a friend when we were in the process I was pregnant but also in the process of moving house and it was a really busy kind of stressful time um, working full-time in my old job Um, and she gave me this lovely bunch of flowers from a local supermarket and it was filled with actually non-British flowers uh, flowers from South Africa mainly and they had a lot of flowers in the bouquet that sort of naturally dried out in a vase that I left on the sideboard and had just completely forgotten about. And, you know, I now, now looking back, I don't even know how it came to be that I took those flowers and created a wreath out of them because I'd never made a wreath before, but somehow that happened. Um, I was pregnant, so I don't know. And like, as I said, a very, very kind of busy time. And that wreath hung in my kitchen for yeah, for two years, really, I think it was um, in the new house. But that process of kind of watching flowers go from fresh to dried, just suddenly sparked something inside of me. And I found it really, really interesting. Um, And I began to, yeah, to kind of experiment a bit more with the things that I had to hand so flowers and things like that that I actually started to buy on the internet to begin with so I bought a lot of dried flowers on the internet um for some reason I hadn't sort of put together that I could grow and dry flowers so I was just buying flowers in even though we had an allotment where we were growing vegetables and I blame the baby brain because I was yeah my (laughs) it was all about six months old so um Yeah. And so I was buying lots of flowers in from the internet, just kind of the bunches here and there. And I had a presence on Instagram. So I had, um, yeah, I had just set up an account on there and I had a lot of spare time on my hands because I was on maternity leave. So I was just sharing lots of beautiful photos of um, things that I was doing. And I found a like-minded community who also loved flowers, many of them who also love dried flowers. And it kind of went from there. Um, But it was quite you know, I've always loved gardening and I've always loved plants, but I've always up until recently felt very alone in that love. So even though my husband Mm. and I used to have an allotment together and did all of that together, none of my friends were into gardening. None of my friends really cared about plants. It's the total opposite now. Everyone's gardening (laughs) as they've got a bit older. So to suddenly kind of, yeah, discover Instagram and this whole community of people who love flowers was amazing, really. So yeah, that's how it started and it's kind of grown from there. So now 
where you live, do you grow many of the flowers you work with or how, what's that percentage look like? Because I guess there's that question. I also want to ask, so what does your business look like now? So, yeah, if I take the first question, which is the growing one, um, I've been on a bit of a journey with growing my own flowers because I, so we recently moved about three years ago and the new garden that we have is about, about half an acre. So I've got more space than I've ever had. I also have an allotment down the road. And I really thought when we moved here that I was going to be able to grow all of the flowers that I would need to create my work with. And that was a real sort of pressure that I put on myself. Actually, it was mm. a lot of pressure. Yeah, and, um, I'm sure. You know, yeah, from having spoken to flower farmers, it's really, really hard work. And what I have realized in the three years that we're here, so it will be the third summer that we're just coming to an end of now. Um putting that much pressure on myself to grow all of my own flowers was uh, actually making it really difficult for me to enjoy doing that anymore. And if you remember what I was saying before, I've always been a gardener and I love growing. Um, and so, yes, I grow my own flowers, but I am very kind to myself now, now and I grow what I can without getting really stressed about the fact that sometimes I don't grow very well because I can't be out in the garden all day every day I have to run my business as well um so I grow what I can and then I have an amazing network of local flower farmers who grow amazing flowers and dry amazing flowers and I build any excess that I have you know that I need I can go to them and buy beautiful stems that I know are going to be exactly what I'm looking for because they're British blown, grown blooms um and that means that I can still enjoy the process um, without getting very, very stressed about the fact that I'm actually not very good at growing flowers. I'm I'm good at gardening, but I'm definitely not a flower farmer. I'm not that way. Um, yeah, my brain doesn't work like that. So, so yeah, I grow what I can and, uh, and I love it. Sure. Well, do you, okay, so then your business is primarily, um, well, I think the thing that intrigued me when I was learning about you was the fact that you do weddings completely out of dried flowers and mm. and you do the you know which is something that i maybe it happens here and there's probably people who do it at certain times of year but i don't really know that that's something that people focus on so in your business what is it that you actually sell i mean do you sell bouquets you sell wreaths you sell i mean do you have um like is it an online shop you know what i'm saying yeah. So um, I think my business is multifaceted. So I have lots of different, um, yeah, lots of different kind of elements of the business. And actually, some of them are very seasonal. So much like a wedding florist would obviously be very, very busy throughout the summer. Actually, the summer tends to be a really quiet period for me because, you know, as you pointed out, maybe some people like to have dried flowers at certain points in the year, but the summer is not really one of them. Mm. You've got so many fresh flowers everywhere that people generally, their heads are not in the dried flower space. Um, so my busy periods are from September all the way through to Easter. And then things are quite quiet from a sort of making and creative perspective for the rest of the year. Um, but I educate a lot. So I run workshops here um, at my home in Devon, but I also travel around the UK to run workshops as well. And that's a really big part of what I do teaching in that respect um i have a patreon account where um i have people that subscribe to me and i share kind of monthly blog posts videos that kind of thing all education but inspiring um and then like you said i have an online shop which is open from september all the way through to spring and i sell wreaths bouquets um flower strings um like lots of lovely things for your home so to make your home look beautiful all with dried flowers and then I do events work as well so that is sometimes weddings it's very small in the UK dried flowers weddings as well so it's you know I know when a bride comes to me and she genuinely does want dried flowers and then we can have a conversation about whether we'll work together but it's definitely not a very big part of my business it would be maybe maximum one a year that I would do um, but I do a lot of installation works for retail spaces and for people's homes. 
So that could be dressing a shop window for, you know, a beautiful interior shop or making a restaurant look gorgeous with hanging flowers, you know, from the ceiling and things like that. So, and then I have my books. So lots of, yeah, lots of different kind of sure. ways. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love that. And I think, I, I think what's interesting is, um, that I guess that way you get to enjoy your your business with your dried flowers and your education. But then since you aren't as busy in the spring and summer, you get to enjoy gardening a little bit more <laughs> too, um, I would think. Yeah, exactly. So that is the that is the benefit of the way it kind of works. I can spend the summer. So as we have just had, you know, um, the summer here in the UK, because I'm not so busy in my studio, I spend most of my time when I am working out in the garden. But I also have two small children. And actually, what that means is that I can take much of the summer off to spend the time with them, which works brilliantly for me. Um, sure. If I was working in fresh flowers, it would be very hard for me to take any time off in the summer at all. So yeah, it works really, really well at the moment. Well, I, there was a few things I noticed that um, I, I wanted to ask about. One of which uh, I saw photographs of, um, some people call it acacia, some people call it mimosa, but they were like dried wreaths yeah. and things like that. Um, that flower to me is tricky um, cause that, that window between, you know, tight and open and when it's at its peak of beauty, um, and drying it, I noticed that you seem to work with some really great dried mimosa. Um, do you source that from local people or how do you, or do you do that yourself? Yeah. I'm curious because it was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I have planted a mimosa tree in the garden, but that was only last year. And I think it's grown probably doubled in size we've had a very wet summer so I think it's really enjoyed that so I might get a few flowers from it next year but I think it's going to be a long time before I'll be able to cut enough to make the wreaths that you were talking about um so no I again I reach out to my network um and there's a lovely um woman who owns a business called Spindle Flowers she's just up the road to me and she specializes in foliages so foliage is selling to florists um and yeah, I reached out to her and said, you know, have you got any mimosa? And she said she didn't, but her neighbor does have an insanely massive mimosa tree and he needed to cut it back and he was selling stems for however much would I like some. And so that's where I got my mimosa from um, last year. And I try as much as possible to buy from the UK. So I know you can obviously um, buy from abroad like France has so much mimosa, it's kind of, yeah, it would be wonderful to be over there. But yeah, because I want to buy as much as I can from the UK, I always find a local supplier. But for things like that, it is often finding someone who has something in their garden. Because, <laughs> yeah, so I got lucky with that. <laughs> but even with that, though, how did you dry it? Because I'm like, to me, it goes from really pretty to shriveled up kind of quick sometimes. Um, I, I know it doesn't have the longest shelf life. I'm just curious if you did anything special. No, not really. But what I would say, I mean, the great thing about obviously buying it through um, Spindle Flowers was that she was able to cut the, the branches at exactly the right time and condition them for me as well. Um, so that really helped. But what I find the best way with mimosa, because one of the problems is that when you dry it, if you dry it too soon, like you said, it just shrivels and you don't get that beautiful kind of golden color. Uh, but actually what can happen if you leave it too late is that all of those balls just fall off um, right. and you're kind of left with just the twiggy bits. So it's kind of that perfect point that before it really explodes that you want to dry it. And I found the best way to dry it was to just sit it in a bit of uh, water in a big vase so that you get those lovely kind of um, flowing branches. When I tried to dry it, hanging it upside down, I just found that it became very kind of dead straight and not very nice. And the flowers didn't seem to develop that much when they went into the drying process. So yeah, for that one, I would recommend kind of putting it in a bit of water um, and allowing the branches to dry in that way over time. 
And so then they just sort of dry on their own. Kind of, I know sometimes hydrangeas, we do that, you know, where we cut them yeah. when they're sort of past their peak and they're a little bit papery and then you can just put them in a little bit of water and then they sort of dry in the vase. So, um, yeah, that that's makes exactly sense. it. That's how I dry all my hydrangeas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Cause I mean, there's a lot of really great delicate flowers, I think, um, that make, you know, that I see being used dried. And sometimes I think how in the world, like, I know one of the things I saw and I, and I struggle with this too, is like the, the, uh, I'm going to try to say it, um, with an English accent, but <laughs> clematis. <laughs> so clematis, oh, yeah. um, um, which yeah. of course a lot of people here say it that way too, but anyway, um, but clematis it, uh, you know, there's wonderful seed heads, uh, I noticed yeah. uh, in some things you've done, you use that. And I, again, I feel like sometimes these really fabulous textures, there, there's just this fine line between fresh and fallen apart. And I didn't know, like, <laughs> do you treat them with anything? You know, because we, you know, we here in the States, like, oh, we just grit out our hairspray and we hairspray or so, you know, yeah. something, <laughs> which I think is awful. Yeah, no. <laughs> um I don't do that at all I'm very everything that I use or don't use rather I should say because I don't really use any sort of preserving materials at all but even when it comes to the things that I make I'm 100% natural as much as I possibly can I want people to be able to if I've made them a wreath or a bouquet or whatever I want them to be able to compost that in its entirety mm. so we can just go back into the earth basically and obviously if you hairspray something you're putting chemicals on it and yeah so, but you're right, it's, um, so with the clematis seed heads, um, it's definitely a fine line. And I often find that with things like, um, so clematis is a good example, but also honesty is another good example mm. where yeah. by the time they are looking like you might want to use them when they're on the plant. So, you know, the clematis that we're talking about is that I've often used as old man's beard, which is wild clematis in the UK. If you were to go and pick it from a hedgerow in, say, end of November, beginning of December, it's looking really fluffy and gorgeous. And you think, oh, that would be amazing to use and create a wreath out of. And then you try to take it out of the hedgerow. Everything's just the seed heads just go absolutely everywhere because it is it's past its best and it's literally setting seed. So you almost need to be picking it in sort of September, October, often when it looks green. So it's still got a bit of fleshiness about it. And the amazing thing is if you bring it in and put it into a warm environment, so my studio, for example, it will puff up into those beautiful kind of fluffy seed heads that we love. And they're a lovely white color because they haven't been damaged by the elements. They've not kind of sat outside for ages. Sure. And they stay intact much more than if you try to take a fluffy seed head from the hedgerow to work with. Um, and it's the same with honesty. If you were to cut honesty, when those silvery middle sections of the pods ha are exposed out in nature, it's too late because the plant's beginning to deteriorate. So you actually need to pick that, you know, when the um, seed heads are kind of still a little bit fleshy, fleshy, have gone a bit papery, dry them and then individually peel all of the seed pods, which obviously takes quite a bit of time, but you then get a really nice sturdy silver disc rather than one that's deteriorating and tissue paper thin. Yeah, no, I'm glad to hear that because a lot of times I feel like um, by the time we think to cut things for drying, it's often when flowers are past their peak and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then they will never, they'll never hold their own. It's the same if you were to take, say, for example, um, you know, a tall spire plant. So something like a delphinium or a larkspar and, you know, you would look at it and think that's the perfect time to cut it because most of the flowers are out and it looks gorgeous. Actually, what you'll find is those bottom third of the flowers are beginning to already set seed and you'll dry it, but all the petals will fall off. Oh. So better, you kind of cut it when the bottom half of the um, spire is in flower and the top part is still in bud. And that means that it will dry beautifully and you'll get a lovely kind of yeah, a lovely spire that goes, you know, thin at the top all the way down to thicker at the bottom and you're not going to lose any petals. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's a great tip. 
Do you find what do the buds do with that? Well, if you have that the 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 flower spike, the spire. When you have that and those buds on top, do they just shrivel up and dry pretty, or do you find that you have to clip those out so that way you have the, your your color? Or do you like? Because I mean, to me, the Nate that naturally it's it's at its it's the most beautiful. You, why would you want to cut it? But I was just curious, just to give the most impact. Do you trim that off or? No, you leave it on. And so even, you know, even though they're still in bud, they still have the colors coming through, obviously, of the flowers and they dry beautifully. They don't really shrivel up any more than the main flowers do. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's really gorgeous. You know, to have those in a bouquet is lovely because you've got these, you know, these lovely kind of tightly closed buds, which still have loads of beautiful color on them. And then the the, the sort of more open flowers down below. So, um yeah never no never have to cut them off they're lovely Good. yeah absolutely well i think a lot of times flower farmers that are growing you know and they're looking for ways to extend their 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 cash flow their season of business or florists that mm -hmm. are trying to find new ways and new things to sort of broaden their their revenue streams i think dried flowers could be i mean it's such a trending thing and there's so much interest yeah. in it right now. I love the fact that you're doing, you know, like storefronts or you're doing installations like that. Um, is that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're known for that. People call you to do that. Um, how do you, how do you approach that? Because if somebody's never done that before, that kind of might seem daunting to sit here and how do you quote this with dried flowers and, um, or is it just the same as with fresh? I think, um, so I spoke at the Flowers from the Farm conference in January. So that's a, the big sort of national organization that we have in the UK, um, which brings together all flower farmers, well, any, you know, flower farmers that want to be part of it. And it basically um, is a way for flower farmers to collaborate with each other and learn from each other. And it's a really brilliant organization. And they ran a conference in January um, for all members that wanted to attend. And the theme behind it was um, plot to profit. So, you know, how mm. do you run a flower farming business and make money, um, which for so many people is you know, really hard thing to do. And I spoke there about exactly this, which is, you know, I don't see dried flowers as a replacement for fresh at all. I see them as an add on to someone else's business, you know, whether that be you're a flower farm or a florist, because what they allow you to do is, as you're saying, if you imagine you're growing a crop in the summer and for some reason you don't sell all your delphiniums or you don't sell all of your straw flowers, why would you not cut them all and dry them and keep them to, to sell later in the year for florists or people like me who are looking for dried flowers to work with? It just makes sense to, you know, preserve and harvest everything that you can. Um, and it can just be an add on to your business at times, potentially when things are maybe a little bit quieter. Um, so there is that side of it, which I think is brilliant and more and more um, flower farmers are beginning to do that in the UK so when I first started this business and before it even really became a business when I was trying to buy dried flowers there were so few available on the internet that I could find um, and I didn't know about flowers from a farm at that point in time so I didn't really know how to go about kind of finding more dried flowers but it's becoming you know, I would say it's not even really a trend in the UK anymore. It's been around so long that I feel like the trend is just now here to stay. It's not like, you know, the most popular flower of the year or something like that. It's every year. It's just people are getting more and more accustomed to it. Um, and more and more flower farmers are drying their own flowers, which is brilliant. And then florists are using them more throughout the winter because it means they can use British flowers even out of season because they're dried. Um, so that's great. But then when it comes to pricing, one of the uh, points of the talk that I was giving in January was to try to help people understand that dried flowers should actually be more expensive than fresh. Mm. And that means whether you're selling them at a wholesale price or you are selling your your work as either a florist or a floral artist or whatever it is that you do, because if you I mean, I don't know if you've ever kind of worked with dried flowers, but it's you know, you have that whole process as it that you would have if you're growing something for fresh, including the harvesting. But then on top of that, you have to prepare your flowers to dry them. You have 
to dry them. And then you have to sort them and store them before then selling them. So there's this whole other chunk of work that goes into, you know, growing a dried flower. And therefore, the prices need to reflect that. And I think for a long time, people didn't really seem to understand that. And so there was quite a bit of pushback at uh, how expensive dried flowers seemed to be or perceived to be. Um, but the reality is, I think they should be sort of 20 to 30 percent more expensive than most fresh flowers basically because of all of that extra time and care that goes into getting them to the point where they last for longer really um so yeah if I was you know I don't work with fresh flowers but if I was a florist and someone came to me and said I want to have an installation in my shop or restaurant and I want something that is going to last for longer than a couple of weeks then um obviously dried flowers are a great option for that and I would be pricing in a very similar way to what I would be if I was doing an installation with fresh but, but I would just be making sure that I costed for those dried flowers in the way that they should be which is they are more expensive they're much smaller than fresh mm, so true you know if you're going to build a re yeah if you were going to make a bouquet out of fresh flowers you know, you can make an insanely big bouquet with not very many stems, but to try to do that with dried flowers, you're talking maybe double the amount of stems to get something as big and bountiful as a fresh one. So it's all these things that you have to kind of think about um, and factor in when you're trying to price your work. Right. Well, and I think too, there's some things you can do with dried flowers. For instance, you know, if like the wreath you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you know, you can take a stem and cut off pieces and that one stem might go a lot farther uh if you're yeah. you know picking or gluing or wiring things into stuff and you know where in a bouquet you might have a st even with a bouquet though you could cut a stem in half a lot of times and have you know depending on the flower um and you mm -hmm. can stretch you can stretch a lot of that but no you're absolutely right i mean you think about all the extra care and tear or wear and tear that goes into preparing uh, those flowers and you're having to harvest them often at the same time you would be harvesting a fresh flower because you want them to be at their peak. You want them to be super colorful. So, um, and honestly, Honestly, the mess they make, <laughs> I know fresh flowers make mess, but dry flowers are on another level. I, I reckon probably about 20% of my time is spent just tidying up after like with all of the bits and bobs that go everywhere and untangling bunches. And yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge. <laughs> I bet. Um, I, I often wonder too, um, I know like you had mentioned the mimosa that you got from that, uh, business's neighbor down the road. Um, I feel like here, um, foraging is a big part of what we do. And sometimes with dried, especially like you mentioned Christmas, a lot of times foraging is a part of some of that. Um, is foraging as big of a thing there in the UK or is that like more taboo? Um, and if so, how do, how do they approach it? I guess sustainably because the thing with dried flowers that I'm sorry, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to let you answer my question. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll answer your question. So, yeah. So foraging is a huge thing here. And, um, but I would say there are elements of tabooness about it. I know that's not really a word, but it's, um, so there were rules around what you can and can't do with foraging. And what you definitely can't do is, um, you know, strip land of, all of its plant material to fund your business basically so and you have to be very careful about the way you do things I do forage but I will forage for things that I know are in a massive abundance so in the UK for example at Christmas time in autumn we have bracken which is just the most mm. beautiful fern that turns a lovely kind of auburn color in the autumn um, and there is so much of it that I know that going to the woods and cutting a few stems of that is actually not going to make any difference to yeah to the woods at all um similarly the hedgerows around here where i am full of beautiful seed heads lots of grasses um, and most of the time those hedgerows are cut kind of around september october time by the local farmer who just cuts everything down to the ground um before winter comes so i just see myself as kind of helping him with his job by removing some of that plant material for him um but yeah, you should definitely not forage or take anything that is 
a species which is obviously not in abundance so things like bluebells and snowdrops and you know even wild daffodils like anything like that is not okay in the UK you need to just yeah be very mindful about how you do things but it's a huge part of it and actually I think for my work my work wouldn't look like it does if I didn't use forage materials and if I didn't use the bits that I've got in the garden because it has a very kind of organic natural look about it and if I only ever worked with you know beautifully grown and dried flowers it would look very different so they're really I, I love foraging and it's uh yeah it's a huge part of my business and and really fuels my creativity as well well I know here this time of year I get a little bit frustrated because you know one of the the huge most po probably most popular elements for this type of year is bittersweet um i'm not sure if you're familiar with that there but bittersweet's one of these vines that produces this fabulous orange yellow and orange berry um and there's an american version and then there's a i think it's japanese version which the japanese version is very invasive so it's almost like it literally can overtake things. And so that's my biggest concern with forging is like sometimes forging these seed heads or these, you know, pods and things of things that could become invasive. And I don't know if that's an issue there, you know, in Britain as it is here, um, you know, with so many things being imported. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely issues around that. Um, but I think if you know plants and I do and I take the time to learn about them as well so I know what's native and I know what's not um and but it's the same you know even if you're not talking about foraging but if you have things growing in your garden mm. or you get a bunch of flowers that have seeds in them and then you put them in your compost it's this kind of contamination of species that you don't necessarily want in the country or spreading them around can be really hard to control um but I think you know, one of the things that I do kind of pride myself on is the fact that I I know what's British. I do know wild plants. My husband's an ecologist. We both, you know, I mentioned before, like we're both nature lovers. Um, so we kind of know what we're doing. Uh, but I always say, like, if people ask me advice about foraging, that if you are unsure on a plant, then don't take it you know, make sure you know what you're cutting and that it's okay, whether that be from a safety perspective like you're talking about, or rather, you know, even if it's just to check whether it's going to be something that's in abundance or actually is a protected species and just, yeah, only take what you feel sure about. Yeah, I think that's wise. It doesn't matter where you are with that. Um, I, I'm i intrigued by something you also said just a minute or two ago that you know a lot of times these uh dried flowers are smaller than the fresh counterparts when you're creating your installations or you're creating something do you find that i know you don't do fresh but do you feel like it uses like double the amount of flowers it would for fresh or you know because when people are trying to plan you know a lot of times they envision a fresh flower they envision what they're used to so when they're transitioning into a dried flower then i'm just trying to figure how do you plan um that accordingly does that make sense yeah it does make sense um so you're right i don't i don't tend to to work with uh, fresh flowers but actually recently I have been moving into actually creating some installations with fresh flowers that then sort of go on to dry which has been a really interesting evolution oh. of my business because um yeah it's just and I only ever work when I do things like that I only work with flowers that I know are going to dry well so I wouldn't kind of take any risks and try drying dandelions for example it's always things that I know are going to you know do really well um but and I always explain to the client when I am doing that that there will be some changes in the appearance of the flowers as they go on that kind of journey and often that means that they will get smaller um mm. but no less beautiful so yeah I mean I think you know you have to kind of think about when you're working with dried flowers well, when you know, if you're a florist and you're working with fresh flowers, the language that you kind of speak in and the way that you will put things together is often it's very foliage heavy. Mm. So, you know, you'll be able to use loads of greenery that you've grown um, that can really give displays quite a lot of bulk to it. And then you can obviously put in your focal flowers and your filler flowers and things like that. The thing that's different with dried flowers is that um, you don't really have those foliages. You don't, there's not a lot of kind of leaves 
leaves that dry that beautiful so you know there's things like eucalyptus um and maybe some beech leaves and things like that but I'm yet to kind of discover a foliage that I really love and so you have to rethink the way you put your pieces together and instead I often talk about textures and fillers and then your flowers on top of that and all your textures and fillers will be more things like grasses um maybe some penny cresses that kind of you know those beautiful mm. seed headed shepherd's purse um nigellas you know all those kinds of things and then your flowers on top um and you will definitely need a lot of those fillers to give you the kind of the presence and the bulk that you want from what you're creating that's interesting because I, I just as you're saying that it made me think you're right there aren't that many dried foliages we need to no. we, need, we need to figure that one out because yeah, eucalyptus no, no, no. i mean no. eucalyptus i've seen many times but um that would be something we need some dried foliages out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i am experimenting all the time like with um some of the umbilifers dry like the foliage is kind of dry really nicely but you it's never I, I just haven't found anything that gives it a presence like if you're making a fresh display and right. you know you have lovely lengths of like you know mint or whatever it is where it's just beautiful um it, it just doesn't yeah it doesn't really translate into the dried um world really Mm, that's too bad yeah that's that's really too bad we need to figure that one out because i mean really there's a lot of things you know like eucalyptus with its fragrance or yeah. i think of like bay what we call bay here um you know that sometimes has that waxy leaf to it that i think would dry yeah. but so many times when the foliages start to dry they look pretty for a period but then they start then they just you know if they're deciduous especially especially they just drop all their foliage so um yeah that's... or they just go a really nasty brown color that's the thing they yeah. can look good for a period of time but then before too long they just tend to sort of deteriorate so um there's lots of different acacias that that do dry beautifully um so that's a really lovely one um but yeah I think it's just it's just a different mindset and when you know people come to workshops and they'll say oh Bex can you give me a list of your favorite foliages and I just say to them you just need to think differently which is instead of foliages to create that kind of filler, you just need to look at your other beautiful things. And there are so many amazing grasses that dry so beautifully, you know, fountain grasses, um, mm. you know, all that kind of stuff that can really give you like a beautiful ethereal kind of backdrop to your flowers. Um, yeah. Yeah. I even think like, you know, we, we mentioned a minute ago about dried hydrangeas. I feel like hydrangeas could be a great, filler that takes yeah. you know because they're so big that they, you can take exactly. up a lot of space yeah um, and also things like um gypsophila so that is mm. a lovely one that dries beautifully and again you know it it just creates a lovely kind of backdrop to the other flowers and um yeah so anything like that where you have that beautiful kind of openness and lots of tiny flowers works really well no that's a great point do you um I noticed I, 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 okay, so I'll confess, I went and I looked at your free demo for your course and you were yeah. creating this lovely sort of um, flower string. Is that what you called it? I think, yeah. um, or like a garland. Um, and you were working with hops and I thought, oh, I love hops. And of course it was yeah. so green, but I think it was fresh, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's a good example of when I was working with fresh that goes on to dry. And, you know, so I think hops, so there are some flowers and some plants that will retain their color for years and years and years when you dry them, but there are others that will, um, you know, basically continue to deteriorate quite a lot and hops is one of them. So when you pick them, they're obviously that amazing, vibrant green color. And they will stay that way when you dry them for a good couple of months, but then eventually they'll start to go that golden color. And then before too long, they may kind of go to that sort of like insipid brownie beigey color, um, just as they continue to evolve. And that's why with the, I was making a sort of display to hang over a table. Um, I was using fresh hops for that because I really, really love the color of them, you know, that kind of vibrant green. And they would have stayed like that for quite a few months actually, before they turned golden. Yeah, I love that color and I love that texture. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that was really amazing. I, I've also um, 
I feel like you can really manipulate dried flowers. You can really create things, sort of like like man-made designs. Like one of the things you were demonstrating was you were wiring, um, I think it was a white Achillea out of, uh, of yeah. some kind and making sort of like what could have even been a flower halo, but you were making like a, a vine of, of these little white flowers to kind of come out of the garland you were making. And, and I think there's so many things we just have to get, we have to kind of get our brain outside the traditional box of we see something, we see its traditional form, and we're like, these are just like paint to a painter. These are just elements that we can use in all kinds of ways. Kinds of ways. And that's such a good I yeah. And I often say, like, when people ask what I do, I don't, you know, I don't class myself as a florist because I do you know, as a medium, dried flowers are just a different way of creating something beautiful. And as you said, you can play around with them and create with them in ways that you just couldn't have imagined doing when they were fresh. Um, so the flower strings are like a really, really popular um, item that I sell on my website and people buy them to just have them hanging in their living room. And then in the course as well, there's another project that I teach, which is um, it's basically how to make picture frames so flower frames mm. using dried flowers and just basically stitching whole dried flowers onto beautifully naturally dyed linen and then framing them and hanging them on your wall so it's a little bit like pressed flower art but actually you've got kind of that three-dimensional um, aspect to it and yeah I just love stuff like that and I like I like just experimenting really and trying new things and finding ways in which I can yeah work with and use the dried flowers so so I've got two questions that kind of might overlap a little bit. One is, um, what are like some of your favorite, favorite flowers to work with dried? Because if people are, if people are new to this and want to grow flowers for drying, so there's that. And then my second question is, what are some flowers you wish more people grew? Because there's not enough of them <laughs> for drying. And maybe there's some overlap there. I don't know. Well, I think I think some of the flowers that I love working with the most um, from a dried perspective and ones that I would probably recommend people start with if they're drying are the more traditional um, flowers. I call them kind of everlastings, but they are ones that already have an almost papery texture to them when they're growing. So they're very easy to dry and they and you don't have any issues with them deteriorating once you've created with them. So you can make something beautiful and you know that it's gonna last for a really long time. Um, and that would be things like the straw flowers, which most people probably know already. They're sure. the, the thing that, that and status are where people go to when they think about dried flowers. And some of those, statuses and everlasting straw flowers can be absolutely hideous in my opinion like really not very nice colors and really lurid um but there's some beautiful varieties out there now like lovely sort of sunset peachy kind of colors and whites mm. and things um so i always recommend if someone kind of wants to start growing or creating with flowers you know that are dried i recommend just starting there because basically nothing can go wrong with those um and within that you've got other amazing um flowers like there's acroclinium which is a paper daisy it's a wild mm. flower that grows in australia natively and they are gorgeous there's another one called xeranthum annum which is um you can get them in sort of whites and purples and they're lovely sort of um double daisy like flowers flowers but they when they sort of age a bit so once they've gone into their sort of fully opened flower stage if you leave them a little bit longer to develop they have this really sort of beautiful patina effect all over their petals which is gorgeous so you get these sort of bronzes and silvers and just really beautiful um so yeah I don't, but you know I'm not short of those, like everyone grows those. So that's great. Um, and then if I think about the things that I wish people grew more of, it, it is those fillers and foliages that I was talking about before, the things that you wouldn't necessarily think I'm going to grow that and dry that. Um, so the jip is a really good example. There's also a lovely um, weed <laughs> called Thalespe, which is in the Crest family. Um, and it is just such a beautiful filler. It's unbelievable. It's my absolute favorite um, 
if I could only work with one plant material, it would probably be that. I could create amazing things with it. Um, but yeah, like the seed heads, the grasses, um, you know, I was picking up from a flower farmer this week and I was picking up some um, some fountain grass, I think it is, exploding fountain grass. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to her, I, don't, I want the, no other florist is going to buy these from her, but I want those grass heads that have gone over <laughs> that are massive and exploding like this and really have like no seeds left on them because they've already set seed. I don't want the green short kind of quite nice and fluffy ones at the bottom. I can't work with those. I want those massive big heads that have gone over because um, I can create beautiful things with those. So yeah, it's those kinds of things that I can never, ever get enough of. I love that you said that because I know that for years and years, we we would buy in uh, explosion grass is what we call it too. Um, yeah. And often it's so, um, it's so tight. It's, you know, it's not full, it's not, it's very green and very compact. Um, and then this year I bought some from a new source and it was huge. And I'm like, wow, now that's an explosion. I'm like, you know, we need more like this. And I could, uh, you know, drying it, I could see is, uh, would be wonderful. Um, yeah, well, it's basically already dried because it's beginning its deterioration stage, right? And what's amazing about it, you know, you're talking like really big kind of heads of this gorgeous explosion of grass, which is you can then break down into individual little sections and they're great for like wreath work or if you were to put that in a flower cloud, like the most beautiful ethereal flower cloud, it would be wonderful. So yeah, more of that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too, is there's so many, you know, we go to the grocery stores or wherever your florist and you see the traditional, um, uh, baby's breath or gypsophilia that you see. And it's, you know, it's the same thing we've seen for quite a long time, but there are a lot, a lot of new varieties out there and old varieties that are like the singles that actually look like these little yep. miniature florets. And I think, I don't know, do, yeah. you, do you get to work with that? Because I'm curious how they dried now, because I think that would be lovely. Yeah, so they, um, so I love the traditional one dried. I don't particularly like it fresh, but I do love the traditional one dried. And that's another one that I would sit in a vase to dry upright, because then you mm. get the lovely flower heads kind of splayed out. If you hang it upside down, you'll just find that they all clump together and it becomes a bit like not Stiff. very nice. Yeah, exactly. Stiff. And instead, you want those kind of lovely open flowers. Um, but some of those varieties that you're talking about, the single, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the names of them. I have grown some on my allotment. It was a bit of an experiment. But what I found was if I left them quite a long time on the plant, so the stem structure became very sturdy, I ended up with, again, a really beautiful filler. And yes, the flowers really do shrivel up to be not very much, but you have a really lovely structural kind of quite fluffy filler that you can can then work with. Um, but you're right. Similarly, as what I was saying about all those, um, you know, the colors that are now available for the straw flowers and the status and things. I think with Jip, there are so many varieties out there and we always go to that kind of, you know, pure white, very double kind of flowered, um, quite tight, closely you know, together clusters of flowers. And actually there are some beautiful ones. There's a lovely pink variety um, mm. called Flamingo Pink. I think it's something like that. And that dries beautifully. Oh, I'm glad to know that because I love that variety. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I want to say, and, and, you, and, and I'm curious what you think. A lot of times when people start growing things like the statuses, um, there are there are now many more colors than there used to be for sure. Um, people tend to gravitate towards, I'm going to say it, they, they gravitate towards purple a lot. And yeah. I would say, no, don't do that. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, um, so actually, interestingly on that color thing, um, I have in my Patreon community, I have this wonderful lady um, who lives in the Nordics and she uh, has been growing dried flowers for years and years and years. And I was saying exactly this to her, you know, isn't it amazing that there's so many more color varieties now? And she said, Bex, there always were, but people stopped selling them as dried flowers, I think became less popular and just sold, sold that like standard mix of 
purples and blues and like all those yucky colors that are just so offensive in my <laughs> eyes anyway well, ditto. Um, so i agree they, yeah but i think they were at apparently they were always there but they've just kind of fallen out of favor and now they're coming back again um but yeah i i think a lot of it's probably down to availability so it's only if you go to a specialist seed seller that you will be able to get those lovely other colors that are available if you just go to um the garden center here in the uk and wanted to yeah. buy some status you would be buying a mixed packet of orange, yellow, purple, and pink and blue. And do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that would be it. Like the primary colors and nothing really very nice in there. Um, so you really need to find those specialist seed sellers that have those lovely varieties that we want to grow. And I'm not sure how this works there, but here we have companies that a lot of them, in order to get these plants to market faster, will do tissue culture like plugs. So you can order like little plugs and, and a lot of times they have some of these hard to find varieties um, nice. in, a, in a much quicker sort of, you know, streamlined process. And you skip the germination process because I feel like sometimes sourcing the seed is the hardest part because um, these seed are in such high demand. They're just hard to find because it's so popular. But But I'm glad you agree because I feel like I, you know, this is one thing if you're a farmer or a designer or whatever, you know, the thing if you want to create a business around anything in the floral industry is know what colors are popular and trending yeah. and embrace it. Because, you know, I, I know I was talking with a seed company one time and I said, you know, why do you still sell this assorted packet of seed? Status is one of the ones I'm thinking of. I'm like, you might sell more if people could buy the pink or the white or the yeah. yellow yeah. Um, because yeah. they get tired of, they plant the seed and they get, you know, 30% purple, 30% that blue. And then, I don't know, you know, whatever's left. And so you get so yeah. much of these colors nobody wants, it just discourages yeah. people from growing it. Exactly. And it's um, my mum is very kind and she saves me lots of things from her garden that she dries. But she she lives in Norfolk and it's quite old fashioned up there. I think it's OK to say that. But um, she often will buy dried flowers on the side of the road for me and um, will come down with bunches of status, which are all in those colours. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do with all of these. And it's probably just some old guy or some old lady who's obviously buying those seed packets from the supermarket and kind of growing them. And but yeah, I um, I think, yeah, I think hopefully with dry flowers becoming more popular, these colors will just become more readily available yes. um, so that we can grow beautiful dried flowers. I agree. Well, uh, one thing I was so impressed with the um, free demo to your course. I wanted to learn more about your course and what you offer in that, because, um, again, a lot of times people, I think don't, don't understand everything that's possible with dried flowers. So do you mind sharing some details about your course? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, well, it was, I mean, it's a real pleasure to, create that i i have um written two books but i personally am a right. very sorry i didn't mean to yeah. skip over <laughs> that because no, um, no, no. Yeah. But i think what it's important to say because it's you know it's um i am a very visual learner so i love books and i read books but actually i really learn by doing things and watching other people do things so that's why i'm a bit obsessed with youtube you know if i ever need to know anything about growing or whatever i'm on there straight away trying to find people who will show me how to do it um, and I also had so much interest from people, particularly in the US, who wanted to learn from me. But obviously, I'm here in the UK and I'm not in a position to kind of do live workshops. And so it felt really special that I was able to put that course together um, to help people understand kind of, yeah, the diversity of dried flowers and what you can do with them. So it was filmed over two weeks here in my um, studio and garden in Devon. And there is lots and lots of information about the flowers that you can grow and forage and how you can dry them as well. And what I loved about it was the fact that I could actually visually show people what those flowers look like fresh and then also what they look like dried. Mm. So that 
you know, even in a book, obviously, both of my books have lots of gorgeous photos in them, but it's not quite the same as kind of being able to like show people with your hands and even being able to, um, so for example, with a straw flower, be able to allow people to be able to hear how those petals feel when they're papery. And so I think that was a real highlight and hopefully really useful for people. And then we cover... There's three main projects and a few kind of extra one thrown in um, as we were filming. But yeah, there's the traditional things like I put together a wreath, which we go out into the woods and forage together. And then I bring back materials and put that wreath um, together for people so they can see the technique, but also how simple it is to create something beautiful just from forage materials. Um, I created bouquets in there as well. So people understood how to put those together. We did a couple of different kind of ideas behind vessels and vases. So how you can put together displays for your houses. Um, and then we also cover a big a sort of slightly bigger installation that you could create at home. You know, if you had a beautiful dinner party or something like that. But equally, the techniques that I teach in that could be, you know, scaled up. So sure. if you're doing a big installation of sort of flower cloud for um a retail space or, or a wedding or something all of those techniques are in there and it was really important that I showed as many of the techniques as I know and so that people can kind of learn from me um, and then the last project was the uh, flowers on fabric as I call it which is the mm. frames that I was talking about earlier which is a really simple um, contemporary beautiful way to display dry flowers in your house basically um, yeah and that's by stitching them to fabric and either hang, having them in a frame or creating a beautiful backdrop with flowers on fabric. Um, yeah, and then there's a whole lot about kind of how I run my business and how I got started. And I think Create Academy are wonderful at taking you on a journey and telling a story of the makers that they do feature in their courses. So it was really nice to kind of get that side of it over as well. And hopefully lots of um, inspiration for people because I've only really been doing this for five years and I didn't do it before. So um yeah, hopefully that's inspiring that side of it too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I did not write this down, so I apologize, but what are the titles of your books? So my first book is called Everlastings, um, and the second one is called Flowers Forever. Mm. That's awesome. Okay, great. We'll have to be look, look for those. Um, I, you know, I always like to write to... Uh, and I will say, let me say this before we continue, um, the free course, if you want to kind of get a taste of it, that she offers, um, you can get the link on that, I think through yeah. your website or we'll I'll tell you what, we'll put the link to that on your page when we release the episode. So that way people can find it easier. And, um, I, I, it's, it's just a really great taste of what, um, Bex does. And so anyway, that's awesome. Uh, I always like to end with my advice question. So I'm curious if you have any advice that you would like to share with our listeners. Yeah. Um, it's quite a tricky one, isn't it? This question. Uh, I think, I think my sort of piece of advice that I would give people is, and it was something that I, I guess really I started my business around if you like and um, so I worked in corporate before I did this I worked uh, for a big FMCG market market FMCG company doing marketing um, and I was deeply unhappy there you know, the usual kind of story and when I left um, I continued to do quite a lot of freelance work in that sort of arena whilst I worked out what I wanted to do with botanical tales and I worked with a business coach um and one of the questions that she asked me and encouraged me to think about was why what was I actually doing this for um besides obviously the fact that I'm incredibly passionate about dried flowers but she said as a sort of you know a sole trader a business owner it's really important to understand what your drivers are and for some people that may be monetary related um for other people it, you know it could be any reason really but what that made me realize that I wanted to achieve with my business was a sense of freedom um, and that meant kind of freedom from the nine to five to a certain extent although sometimes it doesn't work like that sometimes I'm traveling and I you know it but 
just to have that flexibility to be able to kind of define my own days and my own weeks when it comes to work um, and to have the freedom to spend as much time as I can with my boys before they get a bit older and don't want to spend any time with me anymore. Um, and for the first time this summer, I took most of the summer off. I was still growing and things like that, but I had a few jobs over the summer. But for the first time this year, I was able to spend the majority of the summer with my boys. And it just made me realize, actually, I had achieved what I wanted to do with my business. Um, mm. And that felt really good. So I think it would be that, like, really work out what your why is and, you know, just have that as your kind of guiding light or your anchor um, so that you base your decisions around that because um, that will hopefully be the thing that, yeah, makes you happy in the end. Well, so that was a I, bit winded. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. It was perfect. And I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of times I don't think as a entrepreneur or business owner that we take the time to really hone in on those whys and and it causes us to lose our way sometimes and yeah yeah exactly exactly and you know I've definitely lost my way sometimes where I've overworked and you know I just haven't got off the treadmill and all those kinds of things but yeah it just felt like a bit of a kind of homecoming this year where I suddenly thought you know what I've actually achieved what I set out to do and hopefully I can continue that as well <laughs> well we hope so we hope to see a lot more of you and all the amazing things you create. So Bex, thank you so much for being on the Flower Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to talk to you.